It's the 1850s, and the US Army is having a little transportation problem. Their horses and mules are having trouble negotiating the rocky terrain in the southern states, and have the annoying habit of wanting to be fed and watered on a regular basis. The solution was the Camel Corps, a brief experiment that introduced camels into the United States Army as pack animals, and, potentially, as cavalry. For centuries, camels have served as indispensable pack animals, excelling in this role far beyond even the toughest of four-legged animals. Consider, for instance, that an average camel can effortlessly bear over 300 kilograms, 661 pounds, of cargo, more than double the weight a typical horse or mule could manage over similar distances and speeds. In addition, camels possess remarkable resilience to extreme heat, can endure days without additional water intake, and readily consume a variety of desert plants, unlike horses and mules, which might refuse them even when suffering from extreme hunger. The less food you need to pack to feed the camel means the more cargo it can carry instead. Their exceptional sure-footedness allows them to navigate challenging terrains, enabling travel in weather conditions that would render wagon transportation impractical. It's worth noting that the biggest proponent of camel power at the time was the Secretary of War, Jefferson Davis. Yes, that Jefferson Davis. He believed that the camel could prove valuable in the southern states, where the military faced challenges transporting goods and supplies through the desert terrain. To solve the problem, Davis pushed to import camels into America, even writing a report to Congress in 1854 where he stated, I again invite attention to the advantages to be anticipated from the use of camels, for military and other purposes. Finally, in early 1855, Congress set aside $30,000, about $800,000 today, for this experiment. A Major Henry C. Wayne was given the unenviable task of traveling all the way across the world to buy several dozen camels to bring back to America. After several months of scouting suitable camel candidates and asking the locals for a crash course in camel care, Wayne returned with a few dozen camels. He was so proud of himself that he boasted that Americans would, quote, manage camels not only as well, but better than Arabs, as they will do it with more humanity and with far greater intelligence. Well, this hubris didn't last, and several Arab immigrants who are more experienced with the beasts were hired to help out. The newly formed United States Camel Corps quickly demonstrated its value, notably by successfully transporting supplies from San Antonio, Texas to Camp Verde, Arizona, amidst a severe rainstorm that rendered wagons impractical. During another expedition, led by Edward Fitzgerald Beale, it was reported that a single camel proved as effective as four of the finest mules. Robert E. Lee later remarked, following an expedition where some mules perished en route, that the endurance, docility and sagacity of the camels were indispensable, without which the reconnaissance would have failed. Despite these glowing reviews, there were problems regarding the camels' reputed stubbornness and frequent outbursts, causing unease among horses. Nevertheless, horses could be trained to get along with the camels. The soldiers, however, were more familiar with the horses and mules, despite the camels' advantages in certain scenarios. Another downside of the camel project was its association with Jefferson Davis. Remember him? His little spat with the United States that became the Civil War led to the project being viewed unfavorably in the North. Not surprisingly, the Camel Corps idea was quietly dropped within a year of the end of the Civil War, and later, largely forgotten by history. However, some of the imported camels, including thousands imported by businesses around the same time that were rendered mostly useless with the establishment of the Transcontinental Railroad, were simply set free with sightings of wild camel still a thing in the south, going all the way up to around the mid-20th century. <laughs>